on this and to keep on exploring the interconnection of art with social and environmental impact, I will please welcome on stage three brilliant mind, uh, MJ from Lebanon, who is also, so she's a mural painter, artist, and representing Artivista NGO. Please have a seat. <laughs> a curator, Marion Waller, who is the general director of the Pavillon de l'Arsenal in Paris. And fin final, but not the last but not least, as we said, a community builder, uh, Werner Backstein, who is coming uh, from Vienna and founder of the Community Art Network. <laughs> okay, so when we started to work on this session, uh, you all told me some stories of impact. And since I know this is going to be really quick, I want to go straight to the point and I want to ask you stories because I think that social change in art and art is about giving another way of seeing things and another the way of um, another story of the world. So let's start with that. Maybe with uh, you, MJ, since you are the artist around this table. <laughs> um, so you work in Lebanon mostly, in refugee camps, but also in disadvantaged area, in um, uh, underprivileged areas. How did you work with these uh, community? How the project started? And what impact did you want to bring into these communities? Okay. So I'm a mural artist living between Lebanon and France. Uh, and um, I'm a freelance artist, and I've had the chance to work in several uh, projects, social projects and artistic projects through street art. And I went to uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods, uh, refugee camps, schools, and um, they were always beautiful projects. Um, and I, I've seen two kinds of projects. And uh, just I would like to say that I'm representing Artivista today. It's a French uh, association. Uh, it's an exchange uh, artistic project between France and other countries. Um, and uh, they happen to, to select Lebanon uh, as an exchange uh, uh, project. Uh, and this is how I, I met them. And I was very touched by the project because uh, Artivista reached out to NGOs that were already on site. Uh, and helped them and, uh, and supported them by, by uh, talking to local communities. So when, a, when an exterior uh, foreign uh, fund comes along into a country, it's very important that they reach out to the local communities and the NGOs that are already on site and doing the work so that the, the work can be continuous. It wouldn't be just like a very short-term project that wouldn't have any impact on the communities. So Artivista worked with March uh, uh, NGO, and they, um, they work with the former uh, terrorists, and, uh, and they were painting with us. So these people were in a transformation phase, and this is what street art is. It's about transformation. You come into a space that is disadvantaged, um, really uh, there's garbage everywhere, and those, and those projects, they come along, they clean up, they talk to the communities, make them feel visible, seen, and important. Uh, and they participate, they are a part of the project, and they start painting with us, and they feel that they belong. When you participate in the transformation of your space, you feel that you belong, you feel the space is yours, and you're there to do a positive action. Um, we have maybe one special anecdote or one special project that really was for you the most impactful, so you were talking the one with former terrorists, but I know that you work also with schools. Uh, I know there was a school bus you were talking about last time we, we had a chance to meet. Yes. Uh, what was the, maybe something that particularly was impactful for you as well, as an artist? Okay, so this is a school for refugees, for Syrian refugees in the north of Lebanon. And this school was a canvas for me. I did the school bus, the cinema room, the, the, uh, the courtyard. And, um, and uh, one, one story I've seen was really impactful for me. I, I saw a little girl coming with her, with her mother to the school and pleading the school to, to register her daughter, even though it was mid-school year. Uh, and these, these people are, uh, are people who work in agriculture. 
the school is really not important. But the presence of this newly established NGO and school near the camps um, made, the, made the kids want to go to school. And so there I, I saw the impact and the expression on the mom's face and the girl's face just pleading, please, can, can you put my daughter in school? So um, yes, I've, I've seen the impact. And the whole celebration when you, when you do the unveiling, uh, the unveiling of the murals and the kids playing around. And, uh, and uh, during the Artivista project, there were hundreds of, ki of kids just screaming and playing and, uh, and eating traditional desserts. It's always uh, projects of celebration and joy. Coming to you, Werner, and uh, this is the link is uh, access to art and beauty. And again, we talked about it when preparing the session. And you were telling me that you grew up in a small village in Austria with no access to art, um, and that the first social impact maybe is this: everyone has the right to access uh, art. So refugee camp or undeserved. Um, and this is your work. What what you were trying to do, right? Exactly. I, I, just, I just was thinking, listening to you and also listening to the keynote, uh, I, and I, I like the term critical infrastructure, and I'm thinking what you're doing is critical infrastructure. Street arts is actually the most accessible form of arts, and I think we also have to redefine a bit what we mean by arts when we talk about accessibility. My story is I come from a small village in the nowhere. Arts was for the others, not for us. And by the way, very often it's not even the financial uh, uh, obstacles to be part of that. It is that you would not feel comfortable. My family wouldn't have feel comfortable to go into an opera or so because it was not, not our standard. I was lucky enough that an Iranian guy came to that remote place and we played West Side Story and it was on stage. And by the way, playing that West Side Story learned me also on stage, you're equal. You don't see whether you come from a good or, or not so good background. So that was lifting me so much up so that later on I thought, this is my mission. And this is, I want to create these places, actually also these places, also in the out, accessible places for people to actually uh, be part of such beautiful artistic journeys. And then, then I started a, communi a community dance program in Vienna. Um, um, some places where people actually meet each other to connect via arts. But basically my, what I learned and also learned now working in a foundation is we are talking here a lot about social change and systemic change. We use all these big words. But I think there are some preconditions if you're talking about it. And that's, that's where arts play for me uh, an incredible role. When I think about what we have done and seen in, in the history of our societies, there are three wounds. One is we are not connected to each other anymore. So that's really the social problem. We are not connected to environment, to the planet, but not, that's not only the planet. It means we are flying into Paris and we have no idea what is around there. And the third, and that's maybe the, 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 the biggest wound, is that we are not connected to ourselves. We are not connected to ourselves so that we even mirror the mass out what we're doing to the planet in ourselves. So we are, and even people like me working in the social realm, I was working in the NGOs and for human rights, but you know, also with the big wounds in myself, how can I discover myself? How can I go there? And that's why I think when we talk big words like systemic change and social change, there are some precondition. One is, it's about a culture change. It's about a cultural change first. It's about mental models. It's about that we change our mindsets because these models have not worked. We have seen the traditional models and we still apply them self-critically. We still apply them in our foundations too, but it, it didn't work. And that is a bit one thing. And the other thing is we're so much so, uh, and even in sometimes in conferences where I'm you know, not relational, it's all transactional. Give me your business card, give me your, and that, it doesn't work. Ch ever change and collaboration, and if we use more an artistic word, co-creation, which we use so often, means to let go from, in the way who you are, position you have, and start from scratch. And there, I believe arts can come in. And that's why I also believe to, to the keynote, it's not always to find the new thing. Social change, we always say, it's the new hub, the new thing, no. It's more doing, in Italian, I would say, translating the old into the new, indi indigenous wisdom, old wisdom, old knowledge. It's the aggiornamento, 
the Italian would say, translated into the now. And there, I think, what is the best connector when words are not working anymore? What is our basic human language, which you will find in all rituals, and why? So, but what we have done, we have put art as the nice side decoration, you know, a little bit art in the conference, and let's do an art session. <laughs> but that's, that's fundamentally wrong, because it's our fundamental language, which we start before words, and we actually end also when we don't have words anymore. And that's why we believe, not only in the climate real, but when we think about democracies, people who are not talking to each other anymore, or can't talk to each other, how can we bring them together? We have to find our profound common denominator, which I believe is arts. It can be music, it can be murals, it can be exactly what you're doing. And these are the treasures, and they are not the nice to have and the emotional, uh, she's a wonderful street arts and doing a little bit something with the kids. No, this is the most powerful impact. So we have to, in our language, turn things around, what is serious and what is not serious. So that's a bit like what we are jumping in and what we want to support. It's not just to support this initiative, but really to make big noise about not something nice, but something critical I've heard today, critical infrastructure, something basic and something fundamental. I agree. <laughs> I think a lot of people, you are in the, big, the most important session, just so you know, for the public. Um, Marion, uh, so you, as I said, you are uh, the general director of Le Pavillon de l'Arsenal. And as uh, you, as uh, Werner was saying, so changing the narratives and how architecture can also the heritage, which is there for a long time. And you are working right now on an exhibition called The Great Repair, ou La Grande Réparation in French. Um, it's really in Paris, so if people want to go and see it, it's actually open. <laughs> But how did you decide to work on this project? How did it start? Why was it important to, to work on this? Hi. Um, so, yeah, the Pavillon Arsenal is a center for architecture and urban planning in Paris. And um, so we talk about, st uh, about cities, about architecture. And uh, cities are a lot about stories and architecture also. And we try, in fact, to change uh, the stories or to influence the stories. Why? Because uh, for a long time, architecture uh, was about unlimited resources. You know, we, like people used to dream about uh, new, um, new buildings that seemed like infinite, new cities in the desert with uh, infinite uh, resources. And now we think that we have to change this narrative. And that's why we opened this exhibition called The Great Repair because we think that now the narrative, and especially for European cities, has to be repairing, because, you know, the world has been damaged a lot. Um, construction has its part, I mean, in also using a lot of resources, using a lot of soil, uh, using a lot of concrete, and so we have to relearn also how to build our cities. And so this exhibition is about how we can repair architecture, repair cities. And uh, the great repair means, uh, first, a political choice. This political choice is to choose to renovate rather than demolishing. That's the first uh, political choice in architecture. And at the Pavillon National, we are very committed in that choice because it's an act of respect toward existing buildings and it's an act of respect toward existing resources. And then repairing is also acknowledging the work of all people who take care of a city because in order to, you know, to live your everyday life in a city, you need the people who clean the street every day and you don't see them because they do it at six in the morning. People also who clean cultural institutions, and we don't talk enough about that in culture. So that's why we wanted to have that part in the exhibition. So all the people who take care of safety, security, etc., that's also repairing, taking care. And then repairing is also architecture as a tool of so social justice. Social justice in the everyday life, like how we use architecture and urban planning to foster community, uh, to help, um, to help uh, people who are in social housing, etc. 
and also architecture in time of war because right now uh, we have war all around us and so architecture we believe can be a tool to to help also rebuilding uh, communities and cities and to, to create social links again. So this story of Great Repair is about all those things and the exhibition we, we show projects from everywhere in the world and we believe that this has to be the new narrative and not uh, completely new cities and infinite cities. And it's a, you know, it's a cultural fight uh, but we believe that this story is also a beautiful story, so we have to, to push it. Thank you. And this makes me, with the connection with your project uh, in Lebanon, what you do also in Paris, and what you do with uh, the, the network, art, art network. Um, how do you make it long term? As we are talking about impact, social impact, environmental impact, the idea is to have a long term vision. And the artistic projects you were talking about are ephemer. Some, sometimes they are lasting only for a few days or a few weeks or a few months. How do you engage and make it a long-term vision? How do you engage maybe communities or local, um, uh, local uh, people to make it a long-term uh, project? Maybe MG in Lebanon, I know. Sure. Yeah. Um, so for the work to be consistent, uh, you, you have to work with NGOs that are uh, located there and that are going to keep the work going for years. Uh, murals can last for up to 10 years, so it's a good chunk yeah, of it's time. It's a good start. <laughs> it's a good start. Uh, what's, uh, what's ephemeral is the workshops, but the, as well, uh, the NGOs can always call out for other artists to come each year and continue the work. Um, I, Talking about architecture, I've worked with, uh, with a project that rehabilitated the schools that uh, were damaged in the Beirut explosion in 2020. Um, and this, import, this, uh, this project really emphasized the work with the students. So they were part of reconstructing their schools. We did a mural uh, workshop and they painted their courtyards, their, uh, their hallways, uh, they were part of the reconstruction, and it's really important. Their drawings were on the walls of their schools. So it was not just like a foreign funds coming in, uh, just rebuilding, reworking, and uh, putting aside the people, the students, the, the locals. So it's, uh, when you engage them, you are making a, an impact, a long-term impact, and there are memories they will never forget. And if there's an NGO on site, that will keep the work going. It's very important. Okay. Mario, maybe on the Great Repair Exhibition, did you think also of a, maybe a long-term way of making it live for longer than the time of the exhibition? Um, yeah, as you were saying, it's a, a lot about giving tools to the people. That's the title of one part of the exhibition because also to go back on how we did urban planning uh, before. Um, also, maybe, you know, in France, there were all those programs about uh, disadvantaged areas in the suburbs where um, what was like the classical way of doing was demolishing buildings and, uh, and not so much um, giving tools to the people to be part of the project. And right now, I think there is this change uh, of shift which is very important to say you cannot create sustainable neighborhoods if you don't do it with the people and there is still a gap also in uh, what tools we use, um, what narrative we use so that urban planning and architecture become accessible, understandable by everyone and because I mean it's it's like the first place you have is your house, so, so it's, I think it's the job of all people working in that field to, um, to make uh, urban planning more democratic. And that's what we try to do through our exhibitions, our books, also to help all the professionals to, to make that field more open and more democratic. And maybe Werner also. Uh it's a, so it's a way uh, to engage local community, but it's also to engage a supportive network. And this is what you're trying to do with the art community network, is all above the, just the local community, it's also how you bring others. 
Exactly, it's a lot of investing actually in infrastructure and, 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 and even I think the term project is very often tricky because it means like, you know, we do a nice something small and then it's gone. I fully agree, we always, when we support something, it's all about the local communities, that it is owned also by the local communities. But for me, critical infrastructure or to guarantee that things are longer term and more a movement or a program rather than a project, uh, it's also that we invest into spaces and places, community arts spaces and places, and obviously networks so that many come together. And one of the things when I think also here in Paris and I think about these beautiful arts places and the bigger institutions, and I, we work also with bigger institutions, and one of my first question always is, uh, what are you, how do you um, actually measure your accessibility? accessibility, sorry, how do you, um, uh, what programs do you have? And very often they would say, yeah, we, we have programs that people can come in and, and, and cheaper coming or we have, uh, we bring schools in whatsoever. That's nice, but then I say, why do you have big doors? It's not that only people come in, you have to go out. We are talking about public spaces. The opera was not invented in the Italian opera houses. It was invented in the marketplaces. So it was invented on the streets. And I think uh, to, in, to invest also in those spaces and places and give access, also political access, that arts can play a major role as a movement and as programs in the streets, on the marketplaces, in these community spaces is very crucial and there we have to invest into. Um, uh, as I think the time is moving on, um, there was a question that we, we also mentioned and is, uh, the tricky question, but the important one, the financing of art and culture, and I think it's important also to mention it. Um, how do you work today? And we see the decline of public funding pretty much everywhere, but also mostly in Europe, um, in art and in culture. Um, how do you work with corporation? How do you work? Because building a network is also building a network to have support and to have funding. Um, I don't know who wants to, well, do you want to start? Uh, this, uh, it makes me, I mean, we are a foundation, so we are supporting a lot, but it makes me, you know, literally cry or getting angry when I see how it's dealt with. When we see now the military gets all the money, where is the lobby, you know? Now it's all about military, which is insane. We have to invest into reparation or healing. But, uh, but of course, the first thing which is cut out, and also in the school systems, it's the arts, which is cut out everywhere. So, and even in the, in the philanthropy field where I'm working in, you know, you find a lot who would support the arts for art's sake, and that's very crucial and very important. I'm not saying, but you, you find not a lot who would invest into artists like you, which are crucial, and they're actually working, their impact is for the whole society and not only for their own career. And I'm not against those things. I'm not, uh, we shouldn't start to, to actually uh, go into a fight, but we need that too. And that's actually my, if I see one of my main tasks, I wanna be going back actually where I was a fundraiser. I'm going and to want to make so much noise of the importance of, of things what you do and really to convince other funders to chip in. It's again, not the nice to have because that's how, how, how it's dealt. That's how the salaries are. Because if you look at the salaries of people in your field compared to the high arts or compared to other fields, it's insane when you think about what they do for the society. And, and I think that rethinking, we have to do still a lot of work and convince and convince and convince and reach out and just also to be bold instead of being the nice separation, decoration, emotional, Werner, that doesn't help anyone. So, but it's, it's, it's a hard thing. <laughs> Thank you. Mario, you want to Yeah, we are lucky because half of our budget is provided by the city of Paris, which supports us quite a lot, and then half is a private sector or public sector um, uh, sponsoring, uh, which is a lot of work for a small institution like us, but for us the priority is really to be entirely free, so everything that we do is completely free for the public. So we also, you know, we are sponsored by the 
by some um, public or private actors of the construction or urban planning industry so that we can make everything that we produce, that we create, free to the public. And also, what I like in, at the Pavillon de l'Arsenal is that um, there is not, uh, how to say, like it's a small place, quite small, so there is not so much security at the entrance, so anybody can just enter. And we have a lot of like high school students just come there and do their homework because we have tables for everyone. And so, you know, they, they come there, it's a public space. It's really a public space. They are not obliged to see uh, all the exhibitions, but they just come there and, um, and meet. And sometimes we have, you know, like private developers meeting an environmental NGO. And uh, I like, uh, and that's also what a public space is, you know, so we have different people, different ages, and it's free for all of them. Okay. MJ, for the project that you're working in Lebanon, did, uh, how was it? Is it hard to explain what you want to do uh, to funders, uh, to find funders and uh, convince them to follow you on your project? Okay, uh, funding was never uh, a problem because I just get, receive a call, hello, there's a project. <laughs> We have the funding. Lucky one. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is really, it was never uh, an issue for me. The funding in Lebanon is mostly embassies, Swiss embassy, Canadian embassy. Um, in France, you have the municipality, you have the chance to have a, have a country that supports culture and arts. This is amazing. Um, and with Artivista, it's Claire, she's here. She, <laughs> she's always have, she always has the issues with the funding. And uh, I know it's difficult. It's, uh, it's not easy to get uh, investors. Um, but it's true that uh, it's underpaid for street artists. We don't really do it for the money. It's, uh, it's really for, it's not for the money, but they are the best projects you can really be a part of. And I do other things, commercial work, uh, bars, pubs, uh, malls, you know, to, to pay my bills. But uh, those street art projects are really for, for social change, to feel that my work makes sense, that uh, I'm trying to, trying to be part of some kind of change. When democratizing art, uh, interacting with people, bringing people together, uh, it's really, really important. And they're beautiful moments. I'm interested in this. It's so interesting to listen to you, and I love what you say. But I think that's very often what we mirror, also when I worked in the social field. You know, we are intrinsically motivated. And that's why we can be easily misused, <laughs> I say it like literally like that, to not be paid well, which is not okay because your work, you're actually working for the society way more than when I think about some companies and I don't want to blame them, but they may be more support their own profit than the whole society. So this whole question, who is working for whom and what is the value of that work is a big question. Although I fully see your point, I think it's sad because actually you should get paid super well without doing a lot of fundraising. But it's, we are far away from that point and <laughs> gonna hopefully go there slowly. Yeah. yeah, you know, artists and money, they don't really, uh, <laughs> doesn't really work. Yeah, we can, we can discuss about it afterwards, <laughs> but it's an important one that I wanted to raise up. As we are finishing and uh, concluding this uh, session, this round table, I wanted to ask you really quickly, because I see that the time flies, but maybe in one minute each. Um, we talked about last time also about the role of art so as a tool, uh, but do you think, and I started my session with this introduction saying we are in a year of electoral uh, and big change, uh, is art also has a play to be a whistleblower or to be, you know, uh, part of the activism that we see today? Um, Bernard, you wanna? Uh, so much so, I think we are working and we are supporting a lot of people who bring now arts together with activism called then artivism. So a little bit like I think what you're also doing. And I think it plays an incredible role when it comes to speaking up and speaking about the truth, changing the narrative, changing those fake news. You know, we are in information uh, societies, and, but it's more about the stories, as we also said. So I think arts can play a major and played historically, by the way, in all revolutions, in all evolutions, it was always the artist in the forefront. Uh, and it play an incredible role. I'm not saying that they will change now the elections. Uh, I don't think so. But I think at least also in the aftermath when it comes to healing, again and again, the value of the arts is still underestimated, but it plays a crucial role. 
as for myself, activism was um, uh, more of a feminist uh, kind of activism because I, I'm a woman in kind of a masculine uh, field. Yeah. The graffiti is really a masculine, uh, you're in the streets. And, um, and that being in disadvantaged neighborhoods and camps, uh, maybe you don't feel uh, very secure, but, but I never felt in danger. I was really, uh, really well, well hosted and everything. And uh, these are conservative places where I went to usually. And as a woman coming alone and painting and doing her own thing and being free and liberal and talking to everyone is a message on its own. So when you go there and you're respected and you're accepted, it kind of changes the nat narrative a bit, especially when I work with little girls as well. And they see me and they, they, and they feel that they can do the same as well, even if they are in conservative uh, environments. It is possible for them to dream and to feel free. Thank you. Do you want to conclude, Maria? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that definitely we need a new cultural movement uh, because of ecology and because of social justice. We need artists to be at the forefront of that. And they have, of course, a political impact and they can have a uh, a political role and I think I mean it's one of the greatest challenges that we have had so we need so much the artists to to change the narrative and to give hope without them it's not possible thank you so much for being uh, with us today um, I think everyone has understood that uh, art and heritage are more than a tool to regenerate our economy, to regenerate and to have social impact and environmental impact. 